All right, good noon. I can't say it's afternoon because it's noon. So good noon, fine citizens. <laughs> and welcome to Griffith Observatory and to our Apollo 12 celebration. Uh, how many of you went to some sort of celebration for Apollo 11? Yeah, some, yeah. How many of you heard news about Apollo 11 last July? It was in the news. Okay. So how many of you have heard Apollo 12 in the news? Yeah, not many because, you know, when you're second, you just don't get all the attention that the people who did it first do. But in fact, Apollo 12 was a mission to the moon just like Apollo 11. And two astronauts uh, walked on the moon, collected samples, set up scientific experiments, and came back to Earth facing all the same risks and with all the same requirements that Apollo 11 had and, and a few more, which we will tell you about. So uh, let me just, by way of introduction, say that this is one in a series of our celebrations here at Griffith Observatory of the Apollo missions. These are mission patches from all of the uh, Apollo missions. And as you can see, we are at Apollo 12 there, which launched on November 14th. Today is November 16th. Uh, they're on their way to the moon, and um, well, 50 years ago. Uh, and now, 50 years later, we are having celebrations for each and every mission that went to Apollo. So uh, today it, we have a day full of activities. Um, at 11 o'clock, you, if you've missed it, you can always go back onto our YouTube channel and hear uh, Dr. David Reitzel tell us all about why it was harder to hoax it in the technology of 1969 than it was to actually go. So if you have any thoughts or no friends that think it's all a hoax, uh, go watch that presentation, get your arguments lined up, because it really, we just didn't, we didn't have computer graphics. It, was, it would have been impossible. So let me just begin with an assumption that everyone in this room understands. We did go to the moon and people did walk. Uh, so here now at noon, we're going to have a little bit of a longer presentation, 40 to 45 minutes, uh, to talk about the Apollo 12 mission, what it did, what the highlights were, what some of there's some wonderful stories from it. Then we'll take a little break, and at 1.30 we will come back with uh, our special guest, uh, Alan Ladwig, who is sitting over there somewhere. Alan, you want to wave? Hey. 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 Alan was uh, at headquarters, NASA headquarters, when I was working with NASA, and uh, we've known each other for quite some time. And he has a new book out called See You in Orbit, Our Dreams of Space Flight. So he's going to talk a little bit about this. This is about how ordinary people like all of us in this room might travel into space. Not, not just the ones with the right stuff, but is space travel? Well, we've been dreaming about it for a long time, that maybe we, you and I and, or our children or grandchildren could go to the moon. And that's uh, his subject. And then at 2.30, we're going to talk about what the future holds. Are we going back to the moon, and are we going back to stay? So those are all of those talks. And uh, for now, let's uh, move on to today's talk, or this hour's talk, about remembering Apollo 12. I am Dr. Laura Danley. I'm the curator of Griffith Observatory. And with me is Dr. David Reitzel, Tony Cook, and Patrick So. I did those in reverse order. I don't know why. And um, uh, we are uh, here as, on behalf of Griffith the Observatory, which is owned and operated by the City of Los Angeles. So if you're a taxpayer uh, to the City of Los Angeles, the Department of Recreation Parks runs this place, and we have your tax dollars to thank. And we also have Friends of the Observatory. And if you're not a member, please consider becoming a member of Friends of the Observatory that makes myriad programs possible including our fifth grade field school tri school field trip program. So if you like 10th graders, 10-year-olds, uh, if you like 10-year-olds, uh, you know, and you want them to know more about science and astronomy and space, then um, you may want to uh, help support that by joining Friends of the Observatory. All right, on with the subject at hand. So why did we go to the moon? Well, it all starts really well. The, in the modern era, it starts with a dream that goes back centuries, but in, in the modern era, it starts with the Soviet launch of a little tiny spacecraft called Sputnik. And the Soviets were the first to send something into space, and that freaked out a lot of people, including my parents, because nine months later I was born. <laughs> uh, and it's true. Um, and uh, uh, so um, the Americans were not far behind. The Americans launched Explorer 1 just a few months later, and the space race was on. But the Soviets were winning it again and again and again. The Soviets sent the first astronaut into space. 
before the Americans sent Alan Shepard into a suborbital uh, flight. Now, I love pointing out this happened on May 5th, 1961, and less than three weeks later, the President of the United States at that time got in front of Congress and said this. I therefore ask the Congress, above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities, to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Imagine in 1961 committing this nation publicly in a space race with the, our enemy, the Soviet Union, that we were going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, when none of the things that we needed to do it had been invented yet. And uh, so it was an, an incredibly bold challenge, uh, but the nation got to it, and NASA got to it. Uh, so one of the first things we realized if we were going to go to the moon is we better learn a little bit about it. That's so, right. Tony, you want to tell us who is this individual? Yeah, this is uh, James Webb, who uh, was the kind of the, the administrator of NASA, uh, who made the architecture, helped design the architecture of Apollo uh, to make sure that the president's goal would be met. I mean, the president was his boss, so he had to do that. And he's, many people consider him to have been the greatest administrator of NASA because he gave straight answers to the president. You heard Kennedy say that no, none, no uh, goal would be so expensive. And James Webb made sure that it was funded properly. He pointed out to the president that if we're sending people to the moon, well, we really don't know enough about the surface of the moon to design the spacecraft to do it. So he also made sure that robotic probes to uh, answer the questions needed to build Apollo would be sent. And, and James Webb is so well known in the space community. How many of you have heard the name James Webb? But that's because you've heard of it because of the James Webb Space Telescope. So our <laughs> next major telescope that's going to be sent into space uh, is named after this individual. And, and pardon me. <laughs> Administrator Webb for what we did to you. Um, so anyway, coming back to the robotic probes. Yeah, so the uh, plan was for uh, three different kinds of probes. Uh, the first would be the simple one, just sort of crashing a spacecraft into the moon, taking pictures as you go down, and uh, getting you know your results, maybe being able to see uh, if there's rocks and things on the surface, or is it just piles of dust? Remember, at this time, actually, some people really thought that a an astronaut stepping on the moon would just sink into dust. That was a real uh, astronomical possibility. So that had to be uh, dispelled if we were going to consider walking and driving on the moon. Um, then these would be followed up by lunar orbiter to find the areas where we could land on the moon, the exact spots we wanted to land, and surveyor to actually test what the surface was like so that, uh, again, like the foot pads of a lunar lander would be the right size so it wouldn't sink into the soil and, and you know, we designed the right kind of treads for boots and things like that. So, um, so that seemed fairly straightforward. Um, but we were not the first. That's right. And but we, we had to remember that at this time uh, there were uh, two uh, things that the Soviets had done. Luna 2 actually was the first to reach the moon. Uh, they crashed a spacecraft under the moon that actually made scientific measurements, and it had uh, a bunch of little uh, medallions, kind of like uh, dodecahedrons with Soviet Union symbols on it just to dig it into the United States, I think. <laughs> so this is only, this is right after the, uh, the uh, you know, Sputnik was only in 1957, so here we are two years later, the Soviets are returning the first pictures from the far side of the moon. And this made a tr profound impression on everyone because nobody had ever seen the far side of the moon before. And we could see, even in the crude picture, that the far side looked very different than the near side. There aren't as many dark markings. So already, people were very excited, no matter what country they were in, at this achievement. 
So we were really starting from way behind to, to do this. All right, so Jet Propulsion Laboratory proposed the Ranger, and Ranger was going to do all kinds of things. Uh, they had stuck a, uh, a seismometer. Even though Ranger was going to be crashed into the moon, it did have a retro rocket to slow it down to about 175 miles per hour. So it wasn't as hard as trying to land on the moon, but it was slow enough that the TV cameras, which were uh, the TV cameras on board, would be able to get pictures of features as small as uh, less than a meter across or less than a yard wide. Um, this is the, what call, what's called a balsa ball. It was made out of balsa wood, and this would enclose a seismograph. And, um, or seismometer, I should say. And so, even a woman could hold it, it was so light. <laughs> That's right. She probably yeah. built it, for all I know. Uh, I kind of want one. <laughs> but this, would, uh, this had its own rocket and would separate and land on the surface. And actually, some people are beginning to study this again, because it actually might be a rather inexpensive way of putting instruments on the moon. But in any case, that was the plan. All right, so here's the accomplishments of Ranger. Our answer to the Russians and our, our bid to get to the moon. Ranger 1, 1961, uh, there was a problem with the upper stage of the rocket, and it wasn't able to leave uh, low Earth orbit. Ranger 2, same problem, and this one lasted 11 hours before it crashed into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, Ranger 3, here we are six, you know, a year <laughs> later, and, uh, or a year, half a year later, and it missed the moon by 22,000 miles. Close. <laughs> Almost. Uh, Ranger 4, don't worry, you know, they're, they're getting these things fixed, except that the solar panels never opened up on the lander, so it never, never powered up and it just crashed. It wasn't able to so operate at all. <laughs> so Ranger 5, well, again, um, the power mysteriously went out and it missed the moon by 450 miles. So uh, I just wanted to say by, by Ranger 5, now NASA was be under the microscope. Congress said, Ranger 6 will work or else. Heads will roll. So NASA uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory took off all of the experiments except for the TV cameras because they wanted it as simple as possible and get just the basic information needed to help Apollo. But um, if we go here, we see that in the last 10 minutes when it should be taking thousands of pictures, the TV cameras just kind of fizzled. So um, this really uh, got everybody alarmed. I mean, even NASA had plans that if these robotic searches for landing areas and stuff didn't work, already the uh, National Security Agency was being contacted to maybe do a, an Apollo mission with a big KH-11 spy satellite attached as a last ditch thing to find a landing thing before we, we uh, started landing, just in case these other NASA people couldn't do their job right. And bear in mind, we've <laughs> already spent three years of the eight we had to do the project. That's right. And meanwhile, through all this time, and we really haven't gotten into it, but the Russians were every year or so sending a different probe. The Soviets, was successfully yeah. Working. yeah. The Soviet Union was successfully sending stuff to the moon. So, so now we come to Ranger 7, and this really had to work, or, or Jet Propulsion Laboratory really would have probably not been you know, been the thing sending to Mars many years later. Um, so here we go, and uh, the last three Rangers all work perfectly. This is actually Ranger 9. It works so well, in fact, they decided to broadcast it live on television. And this is uh, sped up about 40 times, but it was aimed towards the crater Alphonsus, which was an interesting one. Uh, you know, people thought maybe it had volcanic activity. Um, so that actually succeeded, and it did show features as small as about you know, 18 inches wide, and it showed that there was rough stuff there, so probably not you know, endless seas of dust. Um, Lunar Orbiter also was sent, and this, now the first three of the five Lunar Orbiter missions were sent to scout out 20 areas where Apollo could be sent. So they, they took detailed pictures. The later ones took uh, actually a more scientific approach to the moon and actually mapped the entire moon in quite a bit of detail. So, uh, so that was Surveyor. Surveyor is a, um, oh, I'm sorry. That was Lunar Orbiter. This is Surveyor. Surveyor was another Jet Propulsion Laboratory project. Um, 
It was uh, built, the spacecraft was built by Hughes Aircraft and with cooperation with JPL. And uh, James Webb pointed out to President Johnson that, you know, with Surveyor, we'd get such an accurate feel for the moon that astronauts would really know exactly what they were stepping on. You know, they'd, they'd kind of know ahead of time we could simulate what the feel of the moon would be. I don't think he anticipated that we'd actually have a miss mission of landing right next to a surveyor, but we'll find out more about that in a moment. Now, just before our moment of triumph where we were going to make the first soft landing on the moon, something nobody had done before, guess what? The Soviet <laughs> Union uh, did, did just that. So the uh, Luna 9 probe, uh, took the first pictures from the lunar surface uh, several months ahead of uh, Surveyor being able to do that. And now it's 1966. Right. Yeah. Only, you know, remember what year was all this yeah. Apollo landing stuff. <laughs> so the clock is running. Uh, Surveyor 3 uh, of um, five successful surveyors uh, landed in a crater and took these pictures. And this was in one of the regions that Lunar Orbiter had already decided looked like it could be an Apollo landing site. So uh, scientists were very interested in these pictures, as you will see why. And um, this is a movie made from various frames that Jet Propulsion Laboratory got of, of a shovel on Surveyor actually digging into the moon's surface. Um, Surveyor had a camera that pointed upwards, and then uh, by control from Earth, a mirror could tilt the view around and look, look around the Surveyor. So we didn't have to move the camera, we just moved a little mirror. And you'll see more about that later. Surveyor got the very first view of the Earth from the Moon, from the Moon's surface, and uh, by using filters was able to make a color picture. Um, a few days after this was taken, the sun went behind the Earth, as seen from the moon, producing a lunar eclipse that we would see, and surveyors saw a solar eclipse. So here's the Earth with the uh, atmosphere refracting around uh, the, at I'm sorry, the sun's image refracting through the atmosphere and making a ring. And these, both the successful rangers the lunar orbiters and the, uh, and the uh, surveyors were so exciting that, you know, it, suddenly people thought maybe we really had a chance of succeeding with Apollo. And these are the previews of what astronauts would see. Uh, these are the five different surveyor views. And what's interesting especially is Surveyor 7 landed in the roughest area we could find on the moon. And it made it apparent that if we could aim an Apollo accurately enough, you could probably find a landing spot even in these kind of areas. So it kind of meant that uh, there wasn't any region of the moon we couldn't send something to as long as we had accurate pointing of the lander. And uh, finally, this is a surveyor, I'm sorry, a lunar orbiter three view of of one of the lunar landing regions that uh, would be assigned to Apollo 12. And um, uh, this is actually where Surveyor 3 landed in this view by Lunar Orbiter 3. And uh, this is the crater uh, that they um, landed in, that, I'm sorry, the Surveyor landed in. So uh, while all that progress was being made, even with all the drama with robotics and learning about where we might go in the moon, at the same time, and this is probably more familiar to many of you, we were learning how to send people into space. That all really started with the Mercury program, and so you are certainly familiar with John Glenn and Alan Shepard and those first pioneers that flew just one person in a, uh, in a capsule, first suborbital for two flights and then orbital flights. And here's a picture, the quintessential spaceman in the quintessential shiny silver suit. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what we think of when we think about those astronauts. And then that was followed up uh, by the Gemini program. Ah, missed that one. Gemini program, which had two people flying together uh, and had a couple of firsts. The, the first rendezvous and docking, the first uh, spacewalk. So I know you've uh, probably seen pictures of people spacewalking, um, which was essential if we were going to uh, have, in case there was any kind of problem, we needed to be able to get outside the capsule. We needed to know how to walk uh, and survive outside the capsule and basically how to hang out there for quite a long time because go to the moon and back was not going to be just a matter of a few hours or even a few days.
And these are the new nine, and I always like to say that uh, looks like Pete Conrad didn't get the memo on what to wear. Um, <laughs> but Pete Conrad actually comes back to play because he's one of our astronauts for today's show for Apollo 12. Um, and here's just a picture, part, <clears throat> pardon me, of Ed White on his uh, first spacewalk. So a lot of successes in the Gemini program, and uh, people were pretty excited about our ability you know, the momentum was also building now at about the same time that maybe there was a chance that we might succeed. So enter the Apollo program intended for three people to travel, two of whom would uh, branch off into the lunar module, land on the surface while the third went around uh, the surface, uh, went around the moon in orbit. It needed a very powerful rocket, the Saturn V there on the left, and inside the, the, what they refer to as the fairing, the thing on top of the rocket, um, is the lunar module, which would detach, and we'll hear a little bit more about that. The service module, which gives all the power and, and life support and everything else. The command module, where the astronauts sit. And then there was a, an escape tower on top. And here's a little schematic. After launching into orbit, uh, those parts would come apart, and with, again, with our docking abilities we learned in Gemini, uh, we would reconfigure it and send this configuration to the moon. Now, very tragically, during a test, the very first Apollo, it was actually retroactively named Apollo 1, but uh, there was a, a fire on the pad and three astronauts were killed. And this was heartbreaking uh, because, as you might imagine, doing something so bold and so courageous and on such a tight deadline, if you've ever been part of a team that's really racing to achieve a, a, a big goal, you know there's a very close family sense of a team like that. So this was devastating. Um, and it took a, a couple years for the program to get back on its feet. But eventually, uh, indeed, um, we launched a crew in Apollo 7. There were some other tests. I'm kind of skipping over that. Um, and, uh, and then, lo and behold, their next crew uh, mission went to the moon on Apollo 8. That is memorable because it sent back this picture. And some of you who may be old enough to remember, uh, it was Christmas Eve. The astronauts read from Genesis. It was a very emotional um, time uh, and a quite an achievement to look back uh, at our own home world, and, uh, and it was a message of unity across the planet. Um, Apollo 9 tested the lunar module, and Apollo 10 went and did a dress rehearsal at the moon uh, with the lunar module coming off the command module, going down uh, to the surface, and, not to the surface, going down flying uh, in orbit, and then redocking. We just needed to make sure all of that worked before we committed to sending people to the moon, to the surface. So indeed, Apollo 11 was the great achievement of that. We all know those names, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins. They left footprints on the moon. We talked all about this last July, so we won't go uh, any more deeply into Apollo 11. That was uh, our story from before. But again, it was an extraordinary accomplishment to have done this. And as President Kennedy demanded or asked in 1961, before the decade was out, this was July 1969. Huge celebrations all over the world. And then three months later, the launch of Apollo 12. Didn't get the, uh, <laughs> didn't get the same fanfare. Um, but we're giving it fanfare today. So Patrick, you want to tell us a little bit about the crew and the mission? Right. So uh, you saw in the mission patch uh, that there's a ship there. And, and that's because uh, the uh, crew for Apollo 12 uh, were all in the US Navy. They were actually all commanders in the US Navy. So they had something in common. The commander uh, of, the, of the mission um, was uh, Charles Pete Conrad, and so he would be the equivalent of Neil Armstrong. And uh, command module pilot uh, Richard Gordon uh, would be the equivalent of Michael Collins, who would have circled around the moon. And uh, Alan Bean, the lunar module pilot, would be the equivalent of uh, Buzz Aldrin. So uh, both uh, Conrad and Bean uh, were selected to uh, ride in the lunar module. Uh, which would ascend down to the lunar surface while, while um, uh, Richard Gordon would uh, be in the uh, command module that would circle around the moon. So how was the launch? Well, back in November, of four, November 14, 1969, 
uh, it was it was a stormy day, um, and then four hours. It was hours a dark went, and stormy day. <laughs> it, kind of, yeah. That's how the story began, <laughs> and um, and then it started clearing up. Although it was still overcast, so uh, mission controllers were wondering, can we go or no go? Because they had to launch had had a specific launch window, and they had to launch at a certain time to get the lunar module on the moon when when the sun was only about five degrees above the horizon. Just you know, kind of. Uh, uh, because they didn't need, uh, they didn't want the sun any higher because it would involve a lot of heating on the on the spacesuits and the lunar module and the equipment. So it, it, if you imagine it's like taking a flight at night from Chicago at 8 p.m. and then arriving early morning in London, it's, it's the same kind of deal. You had to leave at a specific time. Anyway, they decided to the launch, Ten, uh, and here's nine, the launch. Eight, ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two. One, zero, all engines running, commit, liftoff. We have liftoff, 11.22 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Pete Conrad reports that your program is in. <laughs> Tower clear, we... A pitch and a roll program and this baby is really going. Pete. Pete Conrad reporting the roll and pitch program to put Apollo 12 on the proper course. And as soon as they send it into a very thick uh, strata of cumulus clouds, uh, they, uh, uh, 36 uh, seconds into the launch, uh, something happened. Ground uh, cameras recorded this. Lightning had struck the, uh, the top of the Apollo spacecraft. And on the left there, you can see the lightning bolt going right through the rocket and then going down the heat exhaust. And then the picture on the right is the lightning actually uh, going from that heat exhaust down to the uh, launch tower and then to grounding uh, channels uh, which are in place um, uh, at the uh, launch pad. Now, that might be kind of significant because it was. <laughs> and uh, while, while the uh, rocket was ascending and approaching a maximum uh, dynamic pressure called Max-Q, you've heard that on SpaceX, uh, they were approaching speeds of uh, 6,000 miles per hour. But when the lightning happened, the panels in the uh, spacecraft, some of the lights went completely black and there were red warning lights and, and uh, alerts inside. And uh, for, uh, um, during that time, uh, there were a second lightning uh, strike happened at 52 seconds into the launch and that made things a little bit worse. <laughs> and uh, so uh, <laughs> mission controllers were frantically uh, uh, trying to get information from uh, engineers. What do we do? What do we do? Uh, one flight engineer uh, said, uh, um, uh, go ahead and uh, do a SCE, SCE to uh, OGS. And so the astronauts were, what, what, what's that? <laughs> well, one of them uh, knew what that was. And in fact, Alan Bean was sitting right to the, to the switch, which was SCE to OGS. And he switched it. And then things began to go to normal. And, uh, and then there was uh, the, uh, the first stage that separated. And they were just ascending right into orbit and uh, got into a 100-mile orbit after that. But they needed to, to do a lot of checking uh, after that to make sure all systems were I can't were imagine going. how scary that I would just be. just mentioned one thing. One of the things that got knocked out was their navigation system. So uh, in pitch for Griffith Observatory, actually, uh, Al Bean and Dick Gordon had done uh, their star training here. In fact, you can see a picture of it near our old planetarium projector with them standing near the, uh, old, near the projector and the director of the planetarium who taught them stars. So they actually used that to get sighting on Orion and getting the uh, navigation system back. Calibrated and back, yeah. But after that dramatic beginning, the mission mm -hmm. then proceeded. So, yes, Patrick? And so now they were excited because now they got all the systems back online. They were going to the moon. So, uh, what did, uh, the first thing was they did one and a half orbits around Earth, and then uh, they had to fire the rocket um, on the third stage, uh, which is uh, f for translunar injection, which was uh, in the blue circle there, right there. And uh, that would uh, uh, accelerate to, uh, the rocket to, uh, to escape the Earth's uh, gravity and send them on the course to the moon. And then 40 minutes later, they would uh, uh, do a maneuver which would then uh, take the command module and uh, grab the uh, dock with the lunar module. And then four days later, they would arrive at the moon. And in that circle there, this is the sequence of events. Uh, the, uh, they would go into lunar orbit, 
And um, the two uh, crew members, uh, Alan uh, Bean and uh, Pete Conrad, would go into the lunar module. And they would uh, orbit the moon and then uh, separate the command module and the lunar module and prepare for a landing. Now, in this particular landing, um, this was a very challenging landing for them. As Tony mentioned, uh, they were going to land, uh, land in a spot called uh, Oceanus uh, Pacerularium. Get, get that right. It's called the Ocean of Storms, and uh, it's Perfect. circled right there. But they had to land um, right next to, or very close to, where the Surveyor uh, 3 landed uh, two and a half years before they arrived there. So you can imagine that would have been a precision landing that they had to achieve uh, compared to the landing uh, of Apollo 11 uh, where they landed four miles off course of the intended uh, landing site. So the, the plan is that if they were to land successfully, they can literally just get out, out of the lunar module and then walk to Surveyor of 3. So here is the landing. We're just, uh, just going to do a few minutes of it. So a little different than Tranquility Base here, you know, the formality of the person. Yeah, hey, the, man, hey, the, babe, you're doing a great job there. Yeah, it, I, was, I was wondering about that, too. But the, this would seem to be more like a low-key landing to me. It was, oh, it's easy. No, it's not easy. Um, so how did they do? Well, their intended landing spot was Landing Site 4, but they actually traveled past Landing Site 4 and landed about 25 feet on the edge of Surveyor Crater. So the Surveyor spacecraft is right, located right there. So they were very close. I mean, call that, that's called a precision landing because there were four other sites that they could have landed, and they landed kind of, kind of within the uh, middle of these four sites. So, um, okay. here's the uh, part where Conrad Foots steps in. <laughs> Quite a lot more personality. <laughs> so one small step. Ooh, it's soft and queasy. <laughs> Did you guys see any about that? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. yeah um, Pete Conrad, who was the one who stepped on the moon, had. Uh, lunch with an uh, Italian writer named Ariana Falacci uh, uh, a few months earlier, and she said, you know, when, when Neil Armstrong said, you know, that's one small step for a man and one giant leap for mankind, NASA scripted that, right? You know, they, they something like this, they're, they're going to tell you what to say. And he goes, no, no, you know, we're free to say what we want. He said, well, I don't believe that at all. He said, I'll tell you what, let's make up what I'm going to say uh, right now, and you know, if it's not not controlled by NASA, you owe me five hundred dollars. So he wrote down that line. <laughs> it's a small step for Neil, a giant leap yeah. for me. Yeah, and Pretty I don't. Big one and for I me. don't know if she paid up or not. But <laughs> <laughs> she, did. she did. She did. Uh, didn't. Okay. She didn't. Wow, oh, that's terrible. What would that five hundred dollars be worth today? <laughs> um, so, uh, so with that egress, they were ready for the right. extravehicular activity. Right. The first so one. after that big whoopee, uh, I'm on the moon. 
Uh, so uh, they began the first uh, surface operations called EVA-1, Extra Vehicular Activity 1. And there were a list of tasks that they had to do, and um, they, they had to do them um, kind of in order. So the first was a TV camera deploy, uh, the flag, the solar wind experiment, and something called um, OWSLEV. So uh, we'll, we'll explain that uh, just a little bit later. Uh, on the uh, left, that's uh, Pete Con Conrad just uh, getting out of the, uh, the hatch of the lunar module for the first time. as photographed from Alan Bean. And then Alan Bean's photographed from uh, Pete Conrad on the surface. And this is the TV camera setup. And um, David, do you want to yeah, say a few the, things about this? Yeah, the uh, Apollo program, of course, brought television cameras with us. We remember the Apollo 11 landing looked about like this. The, the, a lot of people complain it looks grainy, it's black and white. Remember this is 1969, the Brady Bunch was on. Full color television program, people were used to color. So television studios that were in color, however, this is a black and white shot, those are big. That's the, the color cameras there. That's how large they were. So Westinghouse had to miniaturize things. On the right hand side is the camera that was sent with Apollo 11. On the left hand side is the new color camera that they developed to send with Apollo 12. Had a spinning wheel, color filters, things like that. It actually took a higher frame rate. Um, Anyway, details aside, this is the camera that was sent with Apollo 12. They're going to get color television footage, as you saw in that exiting. Um, here's that shot on the left. It's deployed on that uh, sort of a, a bank of equipment. It's called the Mesa that gets folded down. You can see some of the things that are stored there. And let's take a look at the footage um, the camera got. The camera's in there, and he goes to unstow it. When that folds down, the camera's upside down to start with. So when you're seeing him exit on that ladder, they had flipped it around. Then later, as he pulls it off that bench, the camera gets turned it. So the footage you're going to be watching is actually upside down because it's, anyway, the camera was being held upright. They hadn't flipped it yet. Long story short, let's take a look. Fight to rescue weight like we are there, wouldn't you? So you can sort of see the surface of the moon is that white stuff in the upper right. So again, we're upside down. Look at that, that leg good one. Go out there, leg. <laughs> Yeah, they're throwing equipment. The, the gravity there is so light, they can throw things like thermal covers long distances. And they were really thrilled by it. Probably a lot of fun. Great, we're going to get some nice shots. So there's the surface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's real nice moving around up here. You don't just get tired. It really hot like it's burning. Oh, oh, that's... Where or where that was the sun. There it is. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of my favorite parts. <laughs> so the, the camera is no longer functioning very well at this point. Um, we, they got about 45 minutes of television broadcast up to this point. Um, a lot of it just from that stationary shot. They try and fix it. Uh, Houston actually eventually asked them to hit it with a hammer, which they do. They tap on it. They try and bring it back in. They, but not much happens. I was going to deploy this 20 feet at 10, but because of the sun being where it is, we're going to have to deploy a little bit more towards the two o'clock position. What he's talking about is there's sun okay, glinting though. off the lander. So he's going to try and move it around the lander to a different spot to try and fix that. They think the glare might be bad for the camera, which has already been pointed at the sun. So. So stopping it down means giving it a smaller aperture. They think it's too bright, and they're going to try and fix that. But the camera's been fried, essentially, a large chunk of the deck. <laughs> Not so good. Not good, yeah. <laughs> no, it's still, it's still the same, man. I want to try shifting the scene. Now watch what he does. OK, I'm fine. The problem is, man, it's very reflective. Let me, uh... Let me go over here further to the side. 
and you check and see if it reflects too much, and if it does, I'll have to go stick it in the shade, and then maybe shine acetylene. Of course, that makes oh, it tough to do. Oh, you just <laughs> put it in the sun again. Maybe it's the best we can do. <laughs> Oh, yeah, more damage. <laughs> okay, Alan, also you might try the uh, automatic light control to the outside. <laughs> yeah, that automatic light control, that's the part that, well, well the detector fried a large chunk of its uh, detector service, first of all. That's the bright light glinting off of the limb itself, by the way. Um, you could just see what the, the shot would have looked like from there. Here's a picture of the camera. And indeed, rest in peace, well. poor camera, <laughs> the, the color camera. So the, the, the rest of the oh. Apollo 12 mission was still photographs they brought back and a radio drama in a way. They did bring the color TV camera back with them, tested it on the ground, and this is what they saw. Now, the, the, the image on the right is, again, flipped relative to the on the moon. It has to do with the way they're carrying it. But you can see how much of the, that detector was blown out. They, they ruined a good chunk of it. However, the upper portion in that right-hand image is still good. It was that automatic light control sensor that really got fried when it was pointed at the sun. It lost its ability to self-adjust for brightness, and it was stuck in a position that it was, um, well, stopped down. It was too small. It thought it had a very bright light source, and it was saying, no, nope, integrate as short as possible. Let's control this. Had they have been able to get in there, they would have been able to clip a wire, and they would have been able to get at least images in the top half of that camera. They didn't have a screwdriver they could use on the surface to make that fix, though. So in the next landings, the next missions, they sent um, the same color camera, and it did work. And they sent a backup black and white one in case they broke it. And they included a lens cap. So when the astronauts were walking around with it, it couldn't accidentally get pointed at the sun. To the astronauts' defense, they were practicing with a wooden block they didn't have the color camera to practice with, so they didn't know what they were doing. They did probably have a black and white one they might have practiced with at one point, and there's some funny conversation regarding that after the fact, but you can do a little research. But yes. you know, oh, that's the But for a, for a lens cap. Yeah, but oh, for a lens cap. So it, it, that's another reason why Apollo 12 really didn't get the kind of attention, because we didn't have live coverage from the surface, which... Uh, they did you know, on radio, though. Just yeah. Yeah. Live, yeah. Yes, but not live television coverage. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to take a moment to tell a quick story. Because uh, I heard this from a colleague the other day, uh, the TV stations were scrambling. What do we do now, right? Because we don't have our pictures. So both CBS and ABC had people dressed up in astronauts, and ABC. You know, I think CBS actually had a full-scale LEM model, so they were kind of acting out what was being said. But NBC had puppets, <laughs> and this footage. It was, I was talking to Rod Pyle the other day. He said, "I was. I've been dying to find this footage." Uh, it does not exist. Apparently, it, the story is that NBC just destroyed it because they were so ashamed because they took such, they, they literally had marionettes. And then when they said, like, you know, hand me the tool, Alan. And then, you know, they cut away for a second. And when you came back, there was like a little tool taped to the marionettes. Hands. <laughs> and I, I want to see that so badly. But uh, I don't think the footage exists. So anyway, uh, great little story there. The TV stations were scrambling. But anyway, the mission was from there on quite a lot of wonderful successes. And we're going to uh, kind of move through it quickly. Yep. Yeah. So, so all of this uh, without oh, TV sorry. coverage, um, it was all documented with uh, still cam film cameras, and uh, that was you know the o the only images that we saw of the mission. Uh, of course, here's the iconic picture of the, of the raising of the flag, and the next image was uh, this is the solar uh, composition experiment that they have to set up to collect particles from the sun, which they retrieve later for uh, scientists to study um, um, here on Earth, and then they set up. Uh, something called the Apollo Lunar Surface uh, Experiment Package, which consisted of uh, six experiments. This is the first time they did it. And in the, you can see all the experiments set up uh, near a crater there, kind of around the rim of the crater. Um, the power source is this nuclear uh, power generator uh, called a radioactive isotope uh, thermoelectric uh, generator. And uh, that powered all the instruments. Uh, some of the uh, equipment, passive seismic um, uh, instrument measured was to, to measure moonquakes or meteorite impacts, uh, lunar surface magnetometer for um, magnetic fields around the moon. And uh, these two, code cathode gauge and, um, and this one, the ion detector, was to measure particles um, in the, um, that are kind of outgassed from the lunar surface. Uh, the moon had a very, very t tenuous uh, atmosphere. So even when the, um, uh, when the astronauts walked close to these uh, instruments, uh, they could even detect uh, outgassing from their own uh, moon suits. 
And there was a solar wind a, a spectrometer and then uh, a, a instrument to measure how much dust there was in the uh, lunar um, um, uh, environment. So those were the six experiments. Of course, they took lots of uh, core samples, uh, and here's an example of a core sample, which they could dig about 16 feet into the ground. And they saw some unusual uh, sites, uh, a, a kind of like a lunar mound, uh, almost like five feet um, across, and a, um, a little crater with a rock uh, nearby. So that ended, up, ended the um, EVA-1, and that lasted uh, nearly four hours. They spent four hours on the surface of the moon, and they went back into the lunar module, re um, recharged the, uh, the life support suits, um, ate something, and then uh, slept for five hours, and then uh, got ready for the next uh, um, EVA. And uh, this was also something Apollo 11 had not done. So to, they had only had the one. So everything, always every mission, pushing new boundaries, learning new things. So, uh, so what are they going to do on the second EVA? Well, there was a plan, but I want you to hear what they say when they come down the ladder of the lunar module. Now, but I gotta take it easy and watch what I'm doing. Boy, you'll never believe it. Look what I see sitting on the side of the crater. The old surveyor, huh? The old surveyor, yes, sir. <laughs> Does that look neat? It can't be any further than 600 feet from here. How about that? Can you imagine this piece of equipment that had been sent years later? They walked on there, oh, there it is, right there, <laughs> about 600 feet away. So what did they do for EVA 2? They took a walk to Surveyor 3. And uh, here is an image taken from Surveyor 3. You can see the LEM in the background, the lunar module. I, that, I, that just gets me. I think that's incredible. Um, and so there it is, sitting Surveyor, uh, by the way, for all you, well, not, no one in this room believes it's a hoax, but <laughs> come on, this is too great. Uh, so what did they do with Surveyor 3? Okay, so uh, they, they photographed it uh, extensively, and you notice uh, the pad there, there's an impression there. And that's because uh, when Surveyor 3 came down, uh, the rocket fired again and then lifted up a little bit and then landed in a different spot, hence the, um, uh, the, the little impression that's uh, left in the soil. After photographing it, uh, the astronauts, we can go to the next slide, uh, uh, disassemble two parts from the uh, spacecraft. So they and stripped it for parts. Yeah. Yeah, kind <laughs> they of. They put yeah. it up on blocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> put the patents on blocks. And uh, in the next slide, we, we circle uh, two parts. Uh, one is a 17 pound uh, camera they, uh, uh, they took um, off the surveyor. And then also the part of the arm and the little scoop at the end of the arm. Um, they wanted to uh, take it back so that they can find out how. Uh, you know, two year and a half years of lunar environment um, uh, uh, word on the uh, on the grease, the gears, and the lenses, and, and everything else um, on this on this piece of equipment. I remember them commenting that it wasn't white anymore. The surveyor had turned tan. <laughs> oh, That's yeah. right. Two years. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just believe that um, it was covered in a light film of lunar dust, and and went and there were areas where it was actually sandblasted in, oh. to the original color of white. And that was because it was sandblasted by the uh, wash of the uh, lunar, module. Yeah. lunar module descent wow. stage. Very cool. And we'll be talking about the role of lunar dust, which is very bad for uh, <laughs> future exploration in the, uh, in the 2.30 talk. So it was time to leave the moon, but with no television camera, all we had are artists. That's right. So, show. so the 16-millimeter the, the, uh, camera that's usually aimed out of the window so you can see the, the, the lunar surface uh, as they ascend um, had some moisture, so it wasn't working properly. It, it did work a little bit later on, but the images were very fuzzy, so we didn't really get any good images. Of so a ascent. different camera, new and different problems. Yeah. So bad yeah. camera karma. Yep. And as soon as they got into orbit, they spent about a day uh, photographing uh, the, loon, uh, the moon. And uh, they did something when they separated, when the two astronauts got back into the uh, command module, they, uh, uh, the lunar module ascent stage was separated and it was sent crashing onto the moon so that it, um, the um, uh, seismograph that they had uh, set on the moon could measure the, uh, the actual vibrations. And, uh, to the surprise of the scientists, the vibrations rang out for about an hour. 
uh, on the moon. So uh, that was uh, very interesting. So um, with that, uh, they were on the way home, and on the way home, uh, they saw this beautiful um, eclipse of the Earth um, uh, in front of the sun, and um, that's the equivalent of an Earth eclipse. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> as they got close to Earth, uh, the uh, command module separated from the service module, and uh, re-entry occurred, uh, parachutes deployed, and they were they landed in the Pacific Ocean, and uh, the um, uh, aircraft uh, carrier uh, Hornet and uh, the crew had um, uh, retrieved um, the astronauts. But something happened during the descent. What else? Something, uh, something happened to Alan Bean on the descent. Yes. Uh, uh, when so so when the uh, uh, when the command module uh, splashed into the ocean, uh, a, a 16 millimeter camera that was not secured uh, actually hit Alan uh, Alan Bean, Bean in the head. So uh, he got a gash and had to get he had, had and he was knocked unconscious. He was knocked unconscious yeah. and so had talk five about stitches. more camera karma. <laughs> <laughs> it knocked him in the head. So in fact, you'll see him here, and they came on the USS Hornet, and there's a close up with a big bandage yeah. over it, courtesy oh. another camera. It's revenge of the camera for it frying is. the one on the, on the surface. Exactly and, uh, right. And there the sign is. there just free free like before. <laughs> <laughs> And so. There it is with bandage. So the uh, so so the two parts from the severe. Oh, here they are. Um, here's, here's the camera, and uh, also uh, the next slide. There's the scoop uh, on display, and the ne in the next slide there's uh, Conrad uh, proudly holding some of the moon rocks uh, he collected. Uh, on the right there is a moon rock that uh, was different from the uh, from the ones collected from uh, in composition from Apollo 11. Uh, this one uh, was named Creep, and it's uh, K is for potas potassium, and the middle R E E is for rare earth elements they, that they uh, found in this rock, and P is for phosphorus. And this picture was taken by the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter in 2011, and it shows you exactly where the lunar module Intrepid uh, landed, which is right here, and you can see all the foot trails. There's the experiment package. And uh, this is, they went, walked all the way around uh, Surveyor Crater to Surveyor 3. So their footprints over yeah. to Surveyor, yeah. amazing. And uh, this is the uh, uh, descent stage of uh, the lunar module Intrepid. So we can see um, today uh, that those are the parts that are left on the moon. The, the only part that came back from the moon was, of course, the capsule, uh, which was uh, 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 named uh, Yankee Clipper. And it's on, you can see this on display um, in the Virginia um, Air and Space Center. Great. And Patrick, you already covered this, so I'm just going to go past that. And uh, we are about seven minutes over, so uh, we only have time for one or two questions. But uh, before we end the session, I just want to remind you we have two more talks this afternoon. One from our guest, Alan Ladwig, who's going to talk about our dream of space flight. And we hope you might consider going to the bookstore and getting this wonderful book as a lovely holiday present for family members that are interested in space and space travel. Or friends, you could give it to a friend too. Get two, one for yourself. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then uh, we'll have a conversation about what we're doing to get back to the moon and what's, what does the future hold on the moon. So uh, I, I think because of time, are there any burning questions? Yeah. The experiments deployed on the first spacewalk, the six experiments, uh, couldn't those be deployed by a robot of spacecraft? I mean, do you need humans to put out those six experiments? Probably not today, but at the time, maybe if it was a Russian robot was, probe or a Soviet <laughs> yeah. robot we, probe. You know, remember <laughs> remember what we were capable of at that time. Uh, that's why you know the whole hoax, no hoax question. Humans were a better technology than any other technology we had at the time. Uh, so, but today, of course, things are, are a fair bit different. Yeah, and you want them in particular spots, and a human can judge that better at the right place. And to look put at them. the fun we're having with, with uh, putting instruments on Mars right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> you can't even pound things. I, I also yeah. want to say that the experiments that were deployed um, in the Apollo 11 uh, mission uh, uh, were designed to be deployed. Uh, 
within 10 minutes. So it's... Yeah, there's a lot of complexity yeah. to it. Yeah. So uh, with that, I'm going to say goodbye to our, our stream. Thank you for joining us. Come back in 40 minutes and we'll have, a, oh, 36 minutes, and we will have another program for you. And uh, thank you to the panel here, and uh, have a great afternoon at Griffith Observatory. Thank you.